greetings to everyone this uh, video that we have prepared for the viewers is regarding the transfer pricing regulations that the UAE go government has announced which will be implemented from next year onwards so regarding that we would like to have some insights uh, from an expert from HLB International so we have with ourselves Mr. Carlos Camacho from our Costa Rica HLB office who is a global transfer pricing leader and who can based on his experience he can give us valuable insights which can be very knowledgeable for us and I have with me Mr. Jay Krishnan partner uh, indirect tax and regulatory compliances of HLB Hamd. So thank you Mr. Carlos and thank you Mr. Jay Krishnan for joining. Thank you Carlos for joining with us. Thank it's you. It's our pleasure. My pleasure we to be with you. We hope that your experience and your expertise on transfer pricing will be much you know, more insights and valuable information for our audience. Absolutely. And perhaps we have to start by the fundamentals because in many instances, when we talk about transfer pricing, everybody thinks about a comparison between the price of a good or a service or a lending cost, but that is not transfer pricing. So basically, transfer pricing is all about the comparison of what the, the risks assumed by a party, what are the assets involved in a transaction, and what are the functions that the parties are taking part of the value chain. So it's a component of comparisons that we just bench towards uh, multinational enterprises that are deemed to publish their financial information, so public companies mainly, and that comparison then is amongst the three pillars, assets, functions, and risks involved. Okay. So no price involved in the comparison, mm -hmm. because that is normally what the brain leads you towards when you talk about transfer pricing. Okay, so Carlos, from your experience, why transfer pricing regulations are, are getting implemented in, in, in our country? What is the, the purpose behind that? The main purpose of any tax administration to implement a transfer pricing regulation is to protect the taxable base of a corporate tax or even personal income tax. So basically the allocation of the profit to the appropriate uh, uh, portion of the taxable base to the jurisdiction that is trying to tax the functions, risks, and assets assumed by the parties is the main reason why transfer pricing regulations go hand to hand with corporate tax. In other words, without corporate tax, no need for transfer pricing. So the first question that I want to ask is, transfer pricing regulations which are going to come along with the corporate tax people are concerned the entities they are concerned the management is concerned that whether the fta or the tax authority in ua the federal tax authority they want to control the transactions happening between related parties by bringing in transfer pricing regulations so how uh, what is your experience and in other jurisdiction uh, the transfer pricing regulations what the, what what do they achieve what the tax authorities achieve if you can give us an insight that will be helpful absolutely my pleasure and thank you for the chance to be with you. In fact, it's a pleasure to share the experiences in several jurisdictions we have been dealing for the last 20 years in transfer pricing. So basically, the tax authorities are always going to target to increase the taxable base for the taxpayers, despite of the uh, size of the entities and the groups. Uh, with the group regulations, what they do is they try to avoid the bushing of the entity. So they try to avoid that you get a, an artificial reduction of your size because of the exempted amount that is, mm -hmm. in the, is provided in the corporate uh, tax. The ability to look through the group is, is an ability that allows the tax administration to really figure out who's behind. And the who's behind is very important because then what you do is you group the real taxable base. The rules regarding transfer pricing are critical in order to really make the collection effective because what they will allow is to have an effective tax rate 
at the, uh, the more likely to the nominal tax nominal rate. Nominal tax rate. Exactly. So basically the, the idea is to control the profit shifting from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction or within entities in the UA. So in, 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 in other way, you know, shifting from low tax to, to high tax or high tax to low tax, that is what you mean, right? Exactly. The shifting uh, uh, is a behave yeah. of the economical groups and multinational enterprises that normally try to go to the lowest effective tax rate. So it is to do with the legal certainty, which is something that is uh, as important as the tax rate. I mean, you can compete with uh, low tax rates, but if you have a jurisdiction that have very low uh, level of uh, legal certainty, that uh, might not be encouraging for the taxpayer to move or shift profits to that jurisdiction. Now we have companies in UAE who just want to know about whether if they are if they don't have any related parties, still the transfer pricing regulations will be applicable to them or not. So how about in other jurisdictions or what the tax authorities do to entities who don't have any related parties? They are doing normal course of uh, business with third parties. What is the implication of transfer pricing on that? In principle, there should be no application of transfer pricing if their transactions are unrelated. Yet, there are developed concepts beyond related parties that are connected, persons, individuals, or corporations. That is what we call the amplified definition of related parties. Okay. Either you have an economical uh, meaning that is so powerful, such as being a main client or a main vendor, uh, that is a connected person that have an impact in the way that the behavior of the economics do take place. So in that particular case, even if you do not have common shareholders, even if you do not have common management, you will be subject to tax, uh, to, to reassess your taxable base based upon the same principles of transfer pricing as if it would be a related party. So in brief, I think we, we have to look the amplified definition of the related parties, yes, that's right. which might include the connected persons yeah, or, or as you said, you know, in, in any way, the definition, it, he or, you know, she or this company might fall into the, the definition of related party, even if we don't book it as a related party uh, based on the transfer pricing regulation. So basically that review of each entity, whether this is falling under the TP regulations or not, is a critical challenge, though we don't book it under the definition of related party in the books of accounts. Maybe the management of the company, if any of the persons are having any relation or if they are having a controlling stake or a management control over any other entity and that entity is getting involved with this company, that uh, that is the amplified version that you're talking about. It could well be that or even if there is no common uh, control or management, still there could be a connected person if that person is a very important client or a very important vendor or a very important lender of the entity because the transfer pricing is comprehensive of physical uh, goods and as well as services, financing, intra-group services. And of course, if you have a major client, the economical behavior of negotiation is not the same as if you have just a normal client. So it's very important to clarify also that the viewpoint of transfer pricing is all about economics and not about accounting. Okay. So this, this is fundamental because if you wish to understand transfer pricing, you have to be clear that perhaps in your books you have no transaction. For instance, if you have a loan that have no interest agreed amongst the parties, still the imputable interest can be deemed as an economical adjustment, adjustment if that adjustment is on the benefit of the tax administration. Of course, not if it is a expense, but if it is deemed to be treated as imputable income. 
So, Mr. Carlos, one of the important questions that we get from our clients is even uh, I'll just give you a background of that. From VAT perspective, also the common question has arisen, and many of the taxpayers or the registrants are still still having confusion. In UAE, as I asked in the previous question, uh, we have a group structure. For example, a parent company will be there, and then we are having multiple entities under them and in different industry verticals. Now, some of the shared service costs will be incurred by the parent company. The parent company will be incurring all the costs. For example, any IT centralized IT services, HR function, any administrative administrative cost, and all. Later on, they will be allocating this to the different uh, divisions, maybe in UAE or outside UAE through an interdivision advice or something like that. A document will be prepared, and mm. it, it's it's sort of a cross charging. Now, before VAT, the value added tax, since there was no tax, it was just a debit note or a IDA. Uh, then they used to account it. Now, with the implementation of VAT. Uh, the tax authorities over a period of time with various clarifications they have made it very clear that such recoveries or the recharges to the division or the department is subject to VAT at the rate of 5%. Now in the transfer pricing regulation, uh, how uh, it is going to uh, impact or how, how it is going to be considered the charges happening between the parent company and the divisions, uh, how the transfer pricing regulations are going to look into those type of transactions. Basically, they will be deemed to be treated as uh, if incurred amongst unrelated parties, meaning that there should be a margin, there should be a cost plus an allocation of profit. Okay. And with one of the methodologies that is within the OECD guidelines, that is basically the module that you are adopting here in the UA. So basically, the idea is that there is such a thing as an allocation of cost. It should be related to a profit driver. So the margin should be benched to market as well. In some instances, if you are just recovering cost, paying on behalf of that will be a financial uh, transaction other than a cost plus uh, type of uh, yes. recovery. So it will have to be foreseen on a case by case basis. Okay, so regarding, uh, as you said, uh, the cost plus margin. Now, if many of the companies, they don't charge any margin, for example, if a company is incurring an X amount, uh, they are simply allocating that or they're simply recharging the X amount itself without any margin to the ultimate company. So, will that also attract any transfer pricing compliance or anything? Outside of the country, yes, because there is a portion of the expense that is incurred locally that is creating no value for the taxable base in the UEA. So, basically, you will need to charge a uh, margin that is deemed to be a profit. And that there is a differentiation between those that are to do with the core business of the entity and those that are marginal services or low value added services. The low value added services, there is a safe harbor uh, that was uh, given by uh, BEPS, the action site uh, 9 and 10, which is a 5% margin. So cost plus 5% is a safe harbor for low value added uh, services. For those recoveries that are within the country, you can do with no margin. Uh, on cost basis. At the cost basis, correct. Yeah, this concept will be very common in UAE, Mr. Carlos, because UAE is a place where, you know, it's a, it's a global hub of multinational companies, so operating, you know, from across the globe. So you can see, if, if you approach 10 companies, you can see out of 10, eight companies will have, you know, similar transactions. Yes. Like, you know, they, they are sharing the cost or either they're getting shared the, the, the cost from their parent or from other subsidiary office or whatever. So this is going to be a challenge for everyone to understand what you mentioned. And, and, and that will be very useful information for the, the clients. Absolutely. And the way to prove that you are in compliance with the appropriate uh, margin to be allocated to the local jurisdiction is with your transfer pricing documentation because okay. without that you will have no burden of proof okay. uh, when you have an audit procedure so you have to be ready to be audited 
and uh, the consequence of adoption are normally that the tax administrations are very eager to look after the taxpayers in order to figure out whether or not they are in compliance, not only in the fashion of the annual declarations, the documentation as well, but how in, a, in the taxable base the impact of the transfer pricing is increasing the collection of taxes. Yeah, Mr. Carlos, uh, we have seen in, in UAE that, you know, many companies are, you know, either they develop intangibles like softwares mm -hmm. or, or copyrights, patents, etc. Or they get these patents or the uh, in, in technically intangibles like intellectual property kind of things. They get it from their parent office abroad. Mm -hmm. So those cases, what happens is, you know, the clients may try to, to postpone or like they shift the, the, the revenue generation from these intellectual properties to one jurisdiction to other jurisdiction. Whereas the, the IP, intellectual properties getting developed in another state, revenue is booking in another state. So would that impact the, the, the tax shifting and then eventually a transfer pricing? Absolutely, yes. Uh, in fact, that was one of the main uh, uh, analyses of the base erosion profit shifting uh, program of the OECD, which created three chapters of the, or three actions out of the 15 actions that are uh, tackling the intangibles and the creation of value of those things that might be either uh, patents or any sort of copyrights. Mm, copyrights. But furthermore, the things that are less legally coverage such as the list of clients, the list of vendors, the contracts that you have with your clients or vendors, the ability to go and negotiate with your banks to get loans. All of that is what is called the goodwill or the intangible value of a business. That intangible shall be allocated according to a procedure which is called DEMPE in the actions of the uh, OECD. So this means that the allocation of the ownership is not something that you can pick and choose as in the past okay. when the re regulations were not so developed. So most of the multinational enterprises did develop in a very heavy uh, tax jurisdiction and will allocate ownership to a very low income tax Correct. regulation. So basically, the shifting was the way to avoid taxes in that fashion. With the new regulations, with the new approach, we have to see who is the developer, who is bearing the cost of development of that uh, intellectual property. Beyond that, we have to see who is responsible and in fact capable to be able to be enhancing the actual intellectual property and the maintenance of such a, a intellectual property or intangible asset is also critical to allocate to the different uh, entities amongst the group, whether there is two, three or five of the functions that are taken care of by one or two parties in the group. So the other thing is the protection. Protection is not only the legal protection, but also the economical protection. Economical protection. Who, who is able, who is capable to litigate in, on behalf of the group in order to be able to protect the intellectual property. And finally, the enhancement. The enhancement is the ability to keep up to date and in a usable fashion the uh, intangible asset that is created. So basically, it's a continuous analysis. And even if you have one year documented, uh, that change from year to year, depending upon the use of such an asset. So Mr. Carlos, uh, the one of the BEPS action plan, the action plan 13, they have listed or uh, they have uh, explained what all type of documents a company must maintain to comply with the TP regulations. 
that includes the maintenance of master file by the ultimate parent company the maintenance of local file and the cbcr regulations the country by country reporting regulations also which of course will be applicable to mne group whose global ta- global revenue it will be more than 750 million euros or 857 million dollars so uh, how the, how an mne company must you know maintain uh, documents of course those are all the ultimate final documents the master file local file there might be some other uh, what to say documents from which they will be maintaining or the ultimate result will be the local file master file so how to maintain from ground scratch how to maintain the documents is there any sort of methodology or is there any way that they can do it from their existing accounting financial system how they can do it actually is by far beyond the accounting i mean accounting is going to be the base of the analysis of the transactions but in many cases it could well be that there are economical transactions that are not imputed in the books of the entity therefore those are also to be included in the transfer pricing documentation okay, yeah. so the construction in itself is the basis of the construction is the local file okay. local file is critical to create the master file and in most of the jurisdictions master file shall be available to the local authorities as well despite of the fact of the location of the uh, holding company okay. holding company is a must to keep the master, master file but the availability of the master file shall be open to all jurisdictions that have at stake something that they can reassess and in that master file you are going to show what is the components of the different critical angles of your group including important persons related to that very file so it's okay. it's a critical mass and that's why we have to always prepare our documentation from ground to top and not the other way around most of the taxpayers do start from the top to the bottom and that is always a mistake because in, in many instances you are short in many instances you will f- figure out that if you file for instance your tp return without having the documentation all of the sudden when you create the documentation your tp uh, filing is not going to match so you rather start from the beginning with the local file then the master file and for those that exceed the amount of global income of 750 million euros then those are the, by regulation to be filed in the c by c report very few companies will be subject to uh, the c by c report but one of the trends of the oecd and you see within the discussions of the oecd is to start reducing this amount in order to have more coverage okay. of uh, multinational enterprises that must be filing according to action 13 the c by c report so mr carlos this uh master file maintenance so this is what i observed from your speech master file maintenance is not an obligation of a local so when you maintain local file uh, should i maintain master file as well in this country if you have the holding company in this country you are obliged to have the master file but furthermore even if you are just a subsidiary and your holding company is outside the master file shall be available to the local tax authorities because that look up of the master file will give them more clues about the reality and the ground of the construction of the local file okay so the master file uh, is more of the procedural and and and, and the strategy transfer pricing strategies yeah yes, that's what i yes absolutely absolutely and furthermore it develops the whole strategy of the group as far as the entities involved including dormant entities that might be just there as little paper boxes that uh, might become relevant to figure out whether or not there are aggressive tax planning for instance in the in the group so the oecd recommendation is that the master file is not just the conjunctions 
of all the local mm -hmm. files, but furthermore, is a full description of the group, is a full description of the critical assets of the group, the description of the clientele base, as well as the vendors, whether or not those are critical to them or main, main uh, uh, either clients or vendors. So that lead us back to the critical, closely related uh, individuals or, or persons. So most of all, basically, it's a, a document which needs to be maintained at a macro level, at a higher exactly. level. And local file will drill down to the local jurisdiction's details at micro level. Absolutely. Absolutely.